where you stand in this very moment, in this very moment, is in choice, is in choice. Did you know this? Yes. Did you know this? Yes. You're always in choice. You are always in choice. That is an absolutely fantastic book. Hello there. My name's Tim Walter. I'm a house healer and an alternative life coach, and that was Paul Selig. Paul is a highly accurate channel with over 30 years experience and nine books to his credit. And he's got another one on the way. He's not only prolific, the content of these books is also incredibly powerful, working on many levels. To say they are life-changing is quite frankly an understatement. Now, regular viewers to my YouTube channel where we feature content on aspects of spirituality and, be, and in particular, practical applications like dowsing might notice in this video that follows that I was a little starstruck in talking with Paul. As somebody who has experienced channeling myself, I really wanted to ask him about his process as well as discuss some of the content of the fabulous books. You can find out more about Paul's current live streams, workshops and books on his website www.paulselig.com. So here now is part one of our conversation in which we talk about his past, talk about the guides, and of course, the channeled book, The Kingdom. Thank you so much for being here. Obviously, the subscribers to my channel are going to be a mix of people. Some will know you, and some have already expressed their delight that you're coming in to have a chat with us. Some won't know you at all. Could you please just describe who you are, what you do, and how you feel you fit into the world at this time, if I may. Oh, you know, I'm Paul Selig and I'm a conscious channel. I actually sit in a chair, I close my eyes and I receive dictation. And it's a, a verbal dictation and I speak what I'm told as I hear it. And the dictation be, has become, it's now 10 books, the 10th book will be out in September, but in the last 11 years or so, they've, the guides that I work with have been dictating a teaching, you know, an ongoing teaching on the evolution of consciousness. And I suppose you could say the realization of humanity's innate divinity um, at a higher level of awareness than we've been, I hear, able to assume thus far. So I had been a college teacher for many, many years. Um, I was doing this work very quietly since my early 30s, um, but I wasn't looking to be known for this. Um, and it really wasn't until the guides that I work with began dictating books, which I wasn't expecting, um, in 2009, <clears throat> that I became somewhat visible for the work. So. I'm actually always surprised when people do know who I am and what I do is not the other. Um, you know, so that's, that's my work. I'm a conscious channel. I have a practice as a, as, as a psychic as well. And um, I live in Hawaii after a lifetime lived in New York city. And um, that's about it. And Hawaii is a massive change from New York city, isn't it? So how long have you been in Hawaii? I came here in March 2020, and I came here because I had been living in New York and I was working for only one week in Costa Rica, running a retreat. And while I was in New York, while I was in Costa Rica, New York City shut down because of COVID and I wasn't able to return. And a friend found me a place to stay here. Um, but I figured I'd be here for a few weeks until all this mess was sorted out. And I ended up staying and I ended up, you know, finding my own home. And, you know, this is now where I live. Fantastic. Do you um, feel as though you follow that sort of flow uh, throughout your life? I mean, obviously, as a as a conscious channel, you are clearly flowing with the energy of creation through your guides. No, I don't think I mean, I, I think I've been led throughout my life. But I think, you know, it's kind of been at times like a pinball on a trajectory in a pinball machine. You keep bouncing off things. And, you know, I if anybody had told me this would be my work 25 years ago, I think I wouldn't have believed them. And, you know, I had been a writer with the worst writer's block of anybody I've ever met in my life. And... If somebody were to tell me that I'd be producing books that don't require any editing 
over the course of weeks and months, one after the next, I would have thought that was impossible too. I can look back at my life and see how things were set up for me and laid out for me. And um, I expect that I had choice in all of this. I am not a great fan of change, although my guides teach change. Um, so most of what I've done has been, I think, somewhat resisting the flow and then finding myself overwhelmed by the flow and going with it anyway. I'm so glad you said that because that helps a lot of people, I think, um, because I think that there is an impression that, um, you know, one can very easily step into the flow and live life in a very different way to what one would perceive to be a normal way of living. Mm -hmm. But I think the description of being a rather sort of ricocheted around like a, you know, part of a pinball machine is quite appropriate for many of us, especially at the moment. Mm. It's really how we cope with it, isn't it? So how we cope with what we presented with and how what happens there. So the the kingdom. I came to read this um, after reading a book about the quantum brain, which was not one of yours, I hasten to add, but I, I sat down to read this one day after finishing the one the previous night. It's a beautiful book. Um, I think uh, there's undoubtedly the, the, es the essence and the aspect of um, the universe using the tool, the correct tool for the, you know, the correct channel for the job, basically. It is not an easy read, though. Is it? I mean, I expect, is that the sort of reaction that many people give you as, as feedback? Uh, yeah, it, the books are dense. There's no question about it. And, you know, people assume that I'm sitting there writing these books. And in fact, there's no writing involved at all. They're all spoken into being. The recordings are sent after every session to this transcriptionists and then to a proofreader, and then they're put in order as the book without editing. There may be three words in any book that I mispronounced or stepped over or added an S to the word that didn't need to be pluralized. So I think given the fact that this is a spoken teaching, it holds up remarkably well. But is this um, easy reading? Not really, you know, I mean, it's very dense and the books, you know, the guides that I work with explain that the books are energetic transmissions that work directly with the reader. So there's a whole experiential component to these things. And that's been the, the case from the very first book, which was called I Am The Word, which was dictated in 2009 and published in 2010 by Penguin. And in that, you know, very first book, they said this is a book that is experienced more so than read, and it's a journey. And, you know, nobody knew who I was at that point. I mean, there were no books. There wasn't a canon of work. And the reviews started coming in on Amazon, and they were interesting because people were saying, you know, I'm reading this book and my body is vibrating. I'm reading this book and I'm seeing energy fields. And the phenomena has always been part of the experience of the student of this work, which I'm grateful for. You know, when I began channeling, I had a group that met in my apartment and I was about 30, I think, when it started, maybe 31. And I had been studying with the studying energy healing with the teacher and I had asked her permission to do a little group. And she said, okay. And then my own work started coming in the very first class and I was horrified. I began to hear things for the group. And I would say, I think I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing, and people would just say, stop saying I think and just speak. You know, the group, really, I had a very fortunate situation where I was supported and developing. Um, but I wasn't that interested in the information that was coming through me, ever, really. It wasn't until they began really lecturing through me, which was in 2008, after I quit smoking cigarettes, that's when they really began to teach. But I was so interested in the energy because there was phenomena. You could feel it. The whole group could feel it. So my, um, my way into this work was less informational and far more kinesthetic. And, you know, the books, you know, in their density are still, I think, offering that kind of experience to many of the readers. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, it's, 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 as I said before, it's a beautiful thing. And um, I found, actually, I mean, it's a less beautiful thing now, you probably can't see, but there's so many pages of 
uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> fold it down. But I find myself having to go back. I read a paragraph, I have to go back and read it again. Yeah. Everybody, as far as I'm concerned, that ever watches this should buy these books. They are absolutely awesome. Um, smoking. So you were a heavy smoker. Did you stop mm -hmm. smoking because they asked you to? Or they told me to pretty much. I mean, I, when I was a kid, a young man, I was a heavy drinker and I quit drinking when I was 25 and the psychic opening okay. began to happen after that. But I was still a four pack a day cigarette smoker until I was, I don't know, in my forties. And I, you know, was coughing so hard I was falling out of the chair. I mean, clearly it was a medical emergency. But the guys said one night, I was doing a group, and they said, we would like to continue teaching through you, but you're going to have to stop smoking. And um, my group did some work on me that night, and I went to the doctor the next day and got a, an inhaler and a prescription, and I never smoked again. It was the funniest thing. You know, I, I was shocked. I tried to quit before. This time it was just, it was done for me, really. And I've had no desire ever since. So do you see that as being a, um, a, a very tangible sign of um, a shift in your energy vibration to enable you to do that work? Is that how you perceive that? I, I, think, I, don't know, I don't know what I was doing. I know that I was dampening down everything with that. I was operating in a cloud of smoke, you know, and... Um, you know, I think that has many metaphors and many of them are appropriate, but, and it was, it's a poison. So I was poisoning myself, but I don't know what happened. All I, I wasn't, I, I didn't put two and two together right away. All I knew was that when I was doing my little group in my apartment, there was, you know, three people, 10 people, it would, you know, it was no big deal. People would put 10 bucks in the basket. Mm. Um, but all I knew was that I was speaking more. And people started saying, well, that was really beautiful. Maybe you should record this. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear this. Because when I channel, I whisper the words and repeat them. And I'm not a fan of listening to it. It's challenging, I know, for listeners. But that's how it comes. Um, and it wasn't until another medium found out that I wasn't recording and transcribing these things and sort of you know, laid me out for it that I began as an experiment the following week recording and then transcribing. And the very first time I did that, I saw that there was a, a, a perfect, coherent seven page lecture, yeah. you know, that didn't require any editing. And as I said, I'd had terrible writer's blocks. So I was fascinated by this. And I began to look forward every week to see what they would say. And if it would again be something that was sort of spoken into being, so elegantly and it was and when i became willing to do that clearly they were ready and then they said you know we have a book to write and if you take two weeks we'll do it and that was the very first book i am the word it took two and a half weeks because i took two days off to go teach it's a larger story but yeah i i knew two days before that there was a book and i said okay why not not expecting anything would come of it or that it would even be finished, or that it would make any sense. Um, but since that, everything has changed. You know, my my job with this work, in spite of my own challenges with it, and at times my own resistance, um, my job has been to show up for this, and I do that well. That much I really give myself credit for. You know, and. Um, you know, and I, because I show up, they show up, and this odd thing happens, and it happens consistently. And, 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 and I have to say, to their credit, you know, the teachings are enormously consistent over the years. I mean, in, in, in 10 books, I don't think that they've contradicted themselves, but they're really teaching the same thing, unpacked and unpacked, and at different degrees of, of intellectual clarity but that's what it is because your earlier books are, are more about a, a practical process i believe I, as i say i haven't read them i apologize in that respect but mm -hmm. the more of a practical process of again people kind of getting more in line with spirit is that right or not i mean they're all practical no. but 
Yes and no. There, are, I think. I think the, the the teaching, the basic premise of the teaching, I think is is in every text, which is the realization of what the guides call the monad or the Christ manifestation. And the very first book, "I Am the Word," I think is the primer, and I think that's the essence of the teaching. And the following book was called the Book of Love and Creation. That was five hundred pages. That was just ridiculous. To type. I've never read the book. It was so painful to have to type. No, now I don't type my own stuff. I'm so grateful for that. But in the beginning, just listening to myself and being so exacting with every phrase. But that was in some way a textbook of how to begin to operate with the energy that the guides I work with call the word, which they call the energy of the creator in action. And then they did a book called The Book of Knowing and Worth which is an important book, and they really speak to our resistance to claiming our inherent divinity. And then after that, there's the Mastery Trilogy, which is when they get pretty clear about what's required, and then the trilogy that you're on, um, which is the Beyond the Known Trilogy, is all about beginning to operate in what the guides call a higher octave, a higher resonant field. They say everything that we see in this shared reality that we know is existing in an octave of sound and vibration. And that's, and, and really that we're hindered from seeing what coexists with us in a higher level. And they're working with our energetic systems and our consciousness and our abilities to to align to the higher to begin to have a very different experience of consciousness and being there was a there was a, a really nice thing that you or the guide said which was about um okay. yes may i just read this it's a just a couple mm -hmm. of sentences from um the kingdom uh the act of fear so this is the guide's te teaching, obviously. The, the kingdom is a teaching of unification. We must address the idea of separation as a claim humanity has made, is party mm -hmm. to, and is about to transcend. And we say that intentionally, about to transcend, means that the species itself is going to challenge the idea of separation because it can no longer mandate it and continue as it has. Which, uh, to me, sort of sums up really the gist of what you've just said across the whole 10 books there mm -hmm. although you call yourself just the, the person that does the dictation in that sense in that very humbling sense do you have a feeling about the 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 power and the enormity of actually what you're doing of what the words are saying in the books there are times i do when i'm in the transition the transmission when i'm in it I'm present for it. At times I'm challenged by it and have been known to interrupt the transmission. And then they'll say Paul is interrupting or Paul has a question and they'll often take the questions. But I'm not able to take on the enormity of it. I'm, you know, it's, I, there's an old, there's a quote attributed to, um, Helen Shookman, who was the channel for A Course in Miracles. Um, and I heard that she said, I don't believe it, but I know it's true. Yeah. And that feels really right to me, you know, because every time they speak, I can't, I can't discount it. I can't deny it. It all has its perfect sense and wisdom and great love to it. Um, but I, you know, I'm a cranky old man and, you know, I, you know, do what I do and, you know, and I, I have to say it's clear that my life has been altered in extraordinary ways by the guides and the teaching. Am I their best student? I don't know, but you see, I make a real distinction with my role, you know, I, do not claim to be a spiritual teacher. I'm certainly not a guru. I really have no aspirations to be either of those things. Somebody else is welcome to it, but it's not my thing. I was a good classroom teacher for many, many years, and I think it's part of the skill set that I bring. And there was a time, maybe 10 years before I quit teaching college, 
that I found that I just couldn't work with lecture notes anymore. And it was all this sort of spontaneous experience. And I used to love it. I said, this is so interesting. And I was getting, I was being taught how to get out of the way. That's what it was. So all of that was kind of great, but I think of myself primarily as like the court stenographer you know, who's like the last person you're really looking at in the courtroom, she's taken dictation, or the radio that's in a broadcast, and whatever my radio is, seems to be honed in very specific ways. When I turn to the station that the guides are at, they invariably come through with what they prepared. When I work as a psychic, I'm a a medium for the living, which is an odd ability. So I'm not really speaking to people's dead relatives on the other side. Um, But if you haven't talked to your nephew for 10 years and he's living, you know, I can hear him pretty much and often step in and begin to resemble him. And I broker conversations with people all the time at a higher level this way. And I'm known as being very accurate. You know, I've been filmed stepping into people that I've never met and somatizing their, their disabilities or their expressions. And, but, you know, I, I don't think somehow that this makes me special. I think that some people, you know, I'm not six foot four. I'm never going to be a basketball player, you know, and I'm not terribly fit. It's an understatement. I doubt I'm going to be running, you know, the decathlon and, you know, but I have, as we all do, specific abilities and, you know, mine over years now, 30 years, really have been developed. We live in a culture, I think, right now where people watch two YouTube videos and they put up a shingle and they're an expert. And, you know, I don't know how much work it took the guides that I work with to to get my system to do what it now seems to be able to do. Um, and people are different. I don't know how other people's gifts develop. You mentioned physics. I've never read the new physics. I'm always happy when people say, oh, your guides are speaking about string theory and i go oh really what string i'm just so happy that there's some coherence but i don't know this stuff so the fact that you were basically uh channeling stuff while you were still teaching um and but at the same time you were working you were working on yourself i mean you you were doing the work you were doing self-development work at that time i was weren't you i i was uh, when i was in my early 30s and I began studying myself. I was incredibly devoted, but it was a very odd time in the world for me. I was, you know, a, you know, I was out of graduate school. I had found myself basically penniless, and you know, with you know, lots of big problems. Mm-hmm. And then I was waking up spiritually at a time it was the height of the aids epidemic in new york and people that i knew were dying all around me people my age which was just bizarre you know and so it was a time for me at least where there was a sense of emergency and also a sense of i can say you know when i i'd been raised pretty much an atheist right And it was when I was 25 and I was in a hotel room um, in Minnesota working on a project um, and the Gideons leave Bibles in the drawers in the U.S. hotels. And I just took it out and it said, prayer for people in crisis. I said it, you know, and I didn't know what my crisis was. I just knew I was partying too much and very unhappy. But I heard a voice three days later, I heard a voice It was the first voice telling me to get my act together. So that was the beginning for me, you know, that was very much the beginning and the beginning was very grounded in a new potential that maybe there was something more beyond what I had been taught. And that's always been the premise, you know, I certainly don't think that I'm more spiritually advanced than other people. I think I have an energy system that for whatever reasons supports the work that I do. And I have to be somewhat careful with that. Right. You know, it's just, that's my responsibility as best I can be. 
But that's about it. But to see you uh, channeling uh, 30 minutes straight without a break, that's 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 pretty awesome. Um, you know, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, the amount of concentration that takes. I presume, yeah. I mean, do you feel that concentration when you're doing it? Is that like... Oh, I'm happy when they talk a long time because it just means there's more. I means I don't have to do as much. See, the whole thing about channeling is there's no interpretation. And I hear phrase, 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 phrase. I hear the phrase. I'm speak, whispering the phrases. I hear it. Then I'm repeating it in a louder voice as the next phrase is starting to come. So I'm just keeping up. You know, it's like reading ticker tape or, yeah. Yeah. you know, fortune cookies. Yeah. And so my, it's arduous. It's it's a, it's very hard. It's very physically arduous for me to do this, and it is a kind of mental concentration. But there's no interpretation. Occasionally, there's a word that I'm gonna I miss here, you know, or I can't hear it. You'll hear me say in the recordings, other word, other word, other word. And I'll usually plug in response for whatever reasons, and I always forget about this. And if they put response into the sen sentence, they are actually able to re restructure the sentence. I don't know how they do it right. to get their point across, perhaps yes. with initially some different verbiage. But um, when I read psychically, which is more fun for me, I'm interpreting. Oh, so if okay. I get to feel what it's like to be your spouse and, you know, feel her personality and her, you know, her irritations, that's kind of fun. And then you can verify that. With the channeling, the thing that verifies the channeling for me is the energy that comes with it. And also, and when I, when I doubt this stuff, and there are times, you know, over the years when I question it, but I, I kind of say, you know, I don't care how eloquent I may be. I am not capable of closing my eyes and dictating 10 books that don't require yeah. editing. You know? no. No, no. I mean, I, I think that's the that's the, the in a way the funniest thing is does the universe sense of humor to, yeah. to to choose somebody like you as that there was a, a play was it playwriting that you were teaching? I was a playwright when I was a kid. Yeah, I and mean, I right. taught it for years. Yeah, and and then so so as you just said, to 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 envisage and sit down and it deliberately create ten books. With such consistency, and to see the arc going through them, etc. I mean, no writer in their right mind would even think about doing that. You know, when I was um, before the books came, I was meditating one day, or something like that, or talking to God, and I was—I think I was trying to write something. And I said, like, "Am I ever going to write a book?" because um, I never had, and I heard something like 14, and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I said, I'm not going to live that long, you know, no, that's, that's, a, that's probably 30 years worth of work. I don't think I'm going to be around here that long. And, um, you know, they're up to 10 since then, and who knew? But the irony of that is, it's not lost on me at all, and um, I'm grateful for it, but I, I actually don't think about it. I don't think about it that much. It's just this odd thing that happens that I'm party to and present for.